Well, hey everybody, it's Sandy and welcome back to my channel dedicated to helping you advocate for your own health one topic at a time. Yeah, I know I addressed this thing in just my previous video saying how often do you see me with my hair down, right? Because I'm always prepared that I might have to put on an N95 or I will have to as I go on about my day because it's the only thing I use anymore. Um, but today I'm just sort of sitting around the house. So yeah, it's the first time I'm, I've got my hair down. It feels really strange. So I'm not planning to have to put on a mask. I'm planning to just be around the house today. But Anyway, I want to talk about this article that came out today, some new guidance from the CDC, and it's already been a bit of chatter on the Facebook groups page, so I'm going to give that a plug for those of you who like my content if you want a more interactive discussion of both my content and other things that people choose to post up there. Sandy's DIY Health Advocacy does have a Facebook page, and that Facebook page is a group you can ask to join, so head on over to Facebook. Also, I will thank you in advance for subscribing or considering subscribing if you haven't done so already. I do my channel as a public service, so my only way forward is to grow the channel. I don't load it up with all kinds of affiliate links and prey on people's fears and things like that and give biased advice, especially when it comes to people's health and well-being, like, I've recommended N95s and various kinds and reviewed them and whatnot. So I really do appreciate those of you who have subscribed and thank you. Yeah, so this new advice that came out, I was I would normally just do my next video coming up on Tuesday, but I decided that I've just got to, you know, talk about this. <laughs> and forgive me if I'm reading because I've sort of got my notes here in front of me. It's a point-by-point -point, um, piece with all different key points for advice about um, new advice, they call it, for protecting yourself against COVID-19. Never did I see so much irony on paper, let me just tell you that. So it says the Federal Center for Disease Control wants to make it easier for you to steer clear of COVID-19. And today they are streamlining their guidance to better help people understand their risks, how to protect themselves and others, and what actions to take if exposed. Okay. Now, I will say I'm going to go through each one of their recommendations because it's a pretty short list and some of these sound fine. Uh, but I don't see where any of these is really aimed at preventing or steering clear of getting COVID. It's more about what to do and some of the renewed advice about what to do if you have had it, if you do have it. Um, there's a little bit about prevention where they talk about vaccines, but really that's not even 100% true anymore. So let me just get into it point by point. So that's the first thing they say. The, the new guidance was published Thursday um, on the, in the CDC's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. It is intended to hasten the arrival of the day when COVID no longer severely disrupts our lives. And the first thing they say is get vaccinated. Now, I will agree that is very important. I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm really pro vaccines. I do look forward to the day when we have nasal vaccines and something that works at the point of entry. More importantly, something that works on an area of the virus that is not the spike protein, since that's what mutates. And I understand those are in the makings. Wouldn't it be great if we could put some energy toward a warp speed type campaign and not wait like two years for those? Um, but the current vaccines, still have done a tremendous job in preventing severe disease and death and up to and including the delta pandemic they prevented disease entirely so they were never i don't like this whole narrative that the disease was meant to prevent death and uh, severe disease because that really isn't true it was meant to prevent infection in the first place and it did so until we ended up with these omicron variants and subvariants. so um, still i do think that there is a lot of good <laughs> that comes with preventing death and hospitalization and severe disease and even though i don't think i'm likely to die from this at my age and with my health status um, there's no reason for me to get any more sick than i would anyway with it that's not to say that people who aren't vaccinated and boosted aren't getting very sick now with omicron some are uh, and i've heard from some in the facebook group just lately but i, I still do think it is sound advice to get vac vaccinated i'm vaccinated and double boosted now I don't think it's fair to say that this is on the top of the list in terms of mitigation and preventing disease because it's not. And really, I think that they really should have stayed true to their statement on, that they opened up with, which was that this guidance was meant to help you um, prevent or steer clear of COVID-19. Now, it does, getting vaccinated does help with the point that they made uh, where to help so that it no longer severely disrupts our lives. Yeah, maybe, but um, I guess I wouldn't mind that vaccination is here and first on the list if wearing an N95 was second. But as I'm going to discuss in a moment, you'll see that um, wearing an N95 doesn't show up anywhere on this guidance. And that is very distressing for me. 
So, okay, get vaccinated. I can't argue with it. I don't think it's first in terms of steering clear, but it definitely is probably first in terms of seeing to it or getting to the day where COVID is no longer such a disruption. The second thing they say is get tested if you have symptoms. I totally agree with that. A lot of home tests now are sort of the way people are going. And once they turn positive, you know, then very often people don't bother to go get a PCR. I don't know that I would either. Uh, but of course, that creates a situation where we have an undercounting of the infection, not to mention how many people are asymptomatic or how many people aren't getting tested because they just don't care. Um, there's a lot of those people, and I've heard all kinds of accounts that, you know, upwards of maybe we're only getting 10% of the count, so maybe we have 10 times as many infections circulating around as we think. So, yeah, I'm all for the get tested, ideally a PCR test, but I, I really can't fault people who feel sick if they get a positive result on a home test um, for just calling it good. The next point they have is isolate when sick, absolutely, but I'm going to take some issue with this. So they say the day you test positive or the day you have symptoms, whichever one comes first is day zero, and they want you to stop isolating after day five as long as you don't have a fever without medication. So if you're taking Tylenol to bring a fever down, that doesn't count. Um, but um, all of your symptoms have improved and you have no fever, then after day five. So yeah, here's my issue with this. They know good and well that that's not long enough to prevent spreading. People are still shedding, they're still testing you know, positive days. Sometimes they have rebound and that's not only with Paxlovid guys, there's a, a new study that just came out that has yet to be peer reviewed that showed rebound happens with and without Paxlovid. There's a certain percentage of people and it's surprisingly large who get COVID, don't take Paxlovid and get some rebound. And interestingly, the rebound might be worse and might be more prevalent among people who take the antivirals. So that's a whole other discussion. But this whole isolate when you're sick only up to day five, I think we just need to admit it has a lot more to do with the economy. And yeah, maybe if we're talking about um, getting to the point where COVID isn't as much of a disruption to our lives, then um, we it's fair to take into account what's not only good for health, for public health, but you know part of our economy is our health, I guess. So I would be more okay with this isolate when sick and this whole up to day five thing, as long as you don't have a fever and whatnot, if the next part wasn't what it is. So they said, if and when you stop isolating, you should wear a high quality mask through the end of day 10. You know, I have a real issue with a, an organization as specific and as propped up and with the kind of importance that they carry and with the means that the CDC has. I just have an issue with an organization that has this kind of influence over the American public saying something like a high quality mask. Am I, am I, the, am I, <laughs> am I crazy here? Okay, so first of all, what is a high quality mask? I mean, I guess I could go back to the days before we had respirators and I had mask criteria that I developed on this channel because all we could find were fabric masks or we could make our own. And I developed a criteria whereby I said, you know, something that was moisture wicking on the inside layer and then the middle layer would be a polypropylene, hopefully dense, hopefully it would hold water, it would have an electromagnetic charge. And then on the outer layer, it would be something that was somewhat repellent. You know, I guess, who do you know is doing that? Okay, who's doing that? And by the way, really nothing replaces the N95 these days. I mean, could I find some fabric masks, maybe the old DNA that I used to use? Yeah, I think it probably could test close. But at this point, really, there's probably no room for nuance. And there's nothing that beats a well-fitting, properly sealed N95. And, you know, maybe you could argue a KF94 and a KN95, but... You know, they're not saying that. They're just saying we're a high quality mask. How many people do you see saying, you know, that, that a gator is fine? I still, I've seen people when I go to physical therapy wearing bandanas. Like, are you kidding me? So for an organization to drop the isolation period from 10 days down to five days with people who are known to be infected because we don't want COVID to disrupt our lives as much and then say, well, just wear a well, you know, a good quality mask for the up to day 10 I think it's a real disservice to all of us. And I, I would have a, such an easier time getting my head around this and accepting it if they said, wear a properly fitting respirator. I mean, there I think some of these are even available free now, right? So yeah, anyway, they went on to quote that a small study that was published in JAMA um, Network 
found that it took an average of eight days for people with asymptomatic infections to test negative once. Uh, well, among those who had any COVID-19 symptoms, it took an average of nine days for them to test negative. So the first was asymptomatic, the next was symptomatic. So, you know, I don't know, sometimes these rapid tests that people are using, they're probably not gonna use a PCR when they retest. The rapid tests are missing a lot. They're not that sensitive. So, you know, I, I think we're gonna find a lot of people testing negative after day five, uh, that if they had gotten a PCR, they would be positive. And we're gonna have a lot of people just wearing whatever they wanna put on their face and saying, well, that's a high quality mask, you know, because I bought it at, you know, wherever. So I have a real problem with this part of it. And, and by the way, at this point, I said this in my last video, the N95 has emerged at this time. I think it is the king of all mitigation strategies. It's the king of mitigating spread and it's the king of mitigating your own risk of getting infected far better than the vaccines or the boosts. Um, at this point with the current variants that we have around, again, I'd still recommend getting vaccinated and boosted. I, I just don't see how they could go to all the trouble of writing all this guidance. I don't know how much these people are paid to sit down around a table and write all this and say nothing about a respirator in this entire paper. Okay, so sorry, that was my soapbox. Sorry, I'm a little flustered. Uh, the next piece of advice they have is take EvuShield if eligible, I totally agree. Um, I don't think most people are eligible for that. It's for the severely immune compromised and it's a series of injections, but I completely agree about that. They don't say anything about Paxlovid in here. They're silent on it. And for the reasons I just stated, I think the decision of whether to take Paxlovid is real nuanced and I think it has to be discussed with your own provider, your nurse practitioner, your physician. And not only uh, does that discussion have to involve what medications you're on because there's like 300 something medications that... Um, will create issues if you are on Paxlovid. So some, sometimes they mean you can't take Paxlovid. Sometimes it means you have to come off of them for a while. Sometimes it means you have to go on something else during the meantime. But there's also this issue that I think is emerging about rebound. I think rebound is far more prevalent than we're hearing right now. How many of you just anecdotally know people who have been on Paxlovid? How many of them have rebounded? Uh, a lot in my experience. And now that I read the article I just referred to um, this morning, stating that rebound might be worse in people with Paxlovid than without, it's just a very nuanced decision. And I'm not entirely sure I would take Paxlovid at this point if I get infected. I would have to have a, a pretty detailed discussion with my doctor and um, I'd have to give that a lot of thought. The next point they have is forget about quarantine. So quarantine is different than isolating. Quarantine is when you um, isolate yourself just because you were exposed. I, I think we can safely say we're all exposed if you're around anybody you've been exposed. Hence, I get back to the N95. Um, but as opposed to isolation, which means you're already sick, you have symptoms or you've tested positive. So I, I guess, I, yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I think that would have been a great tool early on in the pandemic. But I think that boat sailed and we, it's just not possible. Cut back on contact tracing, I think so too, for the same reason. It's not nimble enough. It's not quick enough. Um, keep tabs on your COVID-19 community level. Absolutely. That is one of the best indicators for me in terms of what I will do. So if the levels are high in my area, that will inform, you know, whether I will go, I'm still going to be wearing an N95 when I do things indoors, but it's just about how much viral load you're likely to bump into, right? So I'm going to relax a little bit when we're not in a spike. When we have a spike in my area, I'm going to kind of dial it back quite a bit. I, I think that's a really important metric. And just remember that whatever the case counts are, again, I think that we're, we've probably, we've got about 10 times is not the number that we're counting. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't really feel like I've learned anything new here, right? I, I feel like they just took a lot of the things they've been saying recently and repackaged it into a paper and so that they could like, I don't know, justify their own existence and the fact that we pay them to sit around and like create this stuff. But there was really, I, I'm using the word create kind of loosely. And I really resent, um, just as a healthcare professional myself, I, and I know who am I to indict the CDC, right? What are my credentials? But you know, I have my education background and training. I've been a nurse anesthetist for over 30 years. And I also came from an institution where my educational institution, the focus was on learning how to continue to research and continue to make um, to educate yourself for the rest of your life so it wasn't really just about what you were training to do as a job um, and it's served me well over the years and i like to think i have a lot of wisdom and hindsight and common sense and um, some of the things that i've thought about were very proactive during this pandemic and have served me really well and some things like the 
um, the powers that be got there, like when it came to masks and other things, apparently they still haven't. But I, I really resent that we've come, there's this striking, just screaming out omission of uh, any discussion of respirators, which is arguably the only tool right now that would really be helpful. So yeah, I'm, I'm kind of sad today about this. I really am, guys. So yeah, I just wanted to talk quickly and get this out there because I just thought, you know, this was important. This came up today and I, I just think it's really important. And I think um, we're going to have to listen to Scott Gottlieb at some point and acquire more of a national security approach to COVID mitigation and not like a public health approach. National security approaches are more proactive. Um, they overshoot the goal. They're, um, they think about what ifs and maybes and just in case and um, maybe do too much, but better safe than sorry. That's sort of the thinking with a national security perspective. Um, in the operating room, we sort of think in that perspective and sometimes in our continuing education uh, seminars, we have people come and speak with us about this, the kinds of things that we want to avoid in operating rooms, accidents like wrong site surgery, wrong foot, wrong eye, wrong whatever. Um, we have to have that sort of proactive perspective, and there's a lot of excess built into it. And, you know, it seems like our public health perspective is just really lagging behind, and it's not fitting for something like a pandemic. So, yeah, well, let me know what you think. I'm kind of doomsday, but I, I hope that it was helpful, and I hope that it'll maybe start some discussion, and please share the video if you think it will be helpful. All right, so until next time, be well. Bye-bye.